Good morning, everyone. I'm so glad to see you guys. I am excited to be able to play a little music today for the first time in a while. There's been ice and cold and all of that, but we get to play. So glad to have Grace Dowdy up here with us. With us. Um, we're going to start out with a song. Lauren Daigle did it originally. It's called Still Rolling Stones. It's kind of a play on the story of Lazarus in the New Testament. Out of the shadows, bound for the gallows, a dead man walking, to love came calling, rise up, rise up, six feet under, I thought it was over, an answer to prayer, the voice of a savior. Still rolling stones. Now that you sing me, I sing cause you gave me a song of revival. I put it on vinyl. Rise up, rise up. I once was blinded, but now I see it. I heard about the power. Right. 
to show you my weakness, my failures and flaws. Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend. Cause the God of the mountain is the God of the valley, and there's not a place your mercy and grace can't find me again. to be with you this morning. I'm excited for this special day. Today is my daughter's birthday, or as close to it as we can get. She is a leap year baby, which means her birthday only comes around once every four years, but this is as close as we can get. That was Isabel. You couldn't quite see her in the back. She was playing keyboards. Awesome, awesome kid. But let's wish her a happy birthday. Can you wish her a happy birthday? She's looking at me with those eyes that say, Dad, you're such an amazing father. I'm so lucky to have a dad like you. I'm not remotely embarrassed by you calling me out on my birthday like this. Thank you so much for your love and goodness and faithfulness and performance as a father. I'm so pleased. Or something like that. I, I know that's a lot to read into one look, but I, that's, that's the way I took it. So thanks, kid. <laughs> you know, one of the big frustrations with living through COVID is not getting to do birthdays sort of the way we want to do birthdays. I'm not a huge birthday party person, but I'm about ready to have some like 
normal birthday parties, all right? There's a lot of kids out there who haven't got to do birthday parties, and grown-ups that haven't got to do birthday parties. Um, you know, when when my aunt, my great-aunt, turned 90 years old, we wanted to have, like, a regular party for her, but, you know, she's turning 90, and it's probably not a good idea. So we did a drive-by on her. Not that kind of drive-by, okay? It's the kind of drive-by where she sat out in her yard and everyone drove by really slowly with signs and waves and say, hey, happy birthday, we love you so much. Maybe I should be grateful though, because COVID kind of got me out of a birthday party that I might, that it might have got me picked on, okay, a little bit. You know, one of, I'm not gonna say what birthday it was, but it was one of those birthday milestones where someone would give you black balloons, some smart aleck person or spouse would give you black balloons on that birthday, so maybe I should be thankful but I'm I'm thinking though once we get through COVID we need to have a birthday bash all right we need to have a birthday party for everyone who didn't get to have like a normal birthday party and and all of that it would be awesome to do that we'll find some place to do a big old cookout we'll just have a, a fantastic time get a band to come maybe we get Chad and Aaron to come to rock that place I don't know we all work for hamburgers or steaks or something we'll, we'll make it work we'll make it work we'll, We'll play some music. We'll have a big old time. I think we need to do that. But of course, we got to get through COVID first. I, I find myself continually saying something to that effect. Anyone else? So yeah, we're going to do that. Just after we get through COVID, once we get past this coronavirus, you know, we're gonna we're gonna do this. Hey, I can't wait. When COVID ends, man, we're gonna have some fun. When 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 we get through COVID, we're gonna play some ball. When's Corona ending? Well, I don't know when, but we'll get together then. We're going to have a good time then. Or if you need a little updated version, wake me up when Corona ends. Something like that. All right, I got the thumbs up from the kids over there. Yeah. So, yeah, but I keep finding myself saying, yeah, once we get through this, once we get through this COVID, then we're, we're going to have fun. We'll go back to normal life. We'll really live then. We just can't do much about it now. And I'm, I'm honestly tired of saying that. I'm so sick and tired of saying, well, we got to get through COVID first. And I know this is the reality in which we live and we got to deal with it. But man, I'm just sort of done with it. This season, this mess, this struggle, you know, we feel like this is the thing we got to get through. Then we can live. But I don't think that's the way the world works. Life ain't waiting on Corona. It just keeps going. So we've got to find a way to keep going. I, I, I keep going back to that same thing. Lord, we got to get through this. We're waiting on you, Lord, to bring us through this. Lord, we're waiting on you to move. And yet the Lord keeps saying to my heart, why are you waiting on me to move? I'm moving. Move with me. We're not waiting on the move of God. We're invited to be part of the move of God that's happening. We can be the move of God right here in our town, in our communities. We are the movement. We are the movement. I want to talk to you about an Old Testament holy day, holiday. The Lord created it for, it, it came at the end of a really busy season. This feels like a busy season, doesn't it? Honestly, this pandemic i feel like i'm busier than i've ever been and i have less to show for it what's that about i feel like all i do is 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 try to do something uh, i will say this pandemic ministry is not like any other ministry i've ever been around i feel like i work crazy harder and uh, just to kind of keep the bare minimum going i want to talk to you about this holiday where it was at the conclusion of a very busy season but it foreshadowed a much greater movement that was going to happen. This was the grain harvest season. That's what they were celebrating. Now, I know to uh, in our culture, in our time, uh, we're not grain farmers, all right? For the most part, if you farm any grain, I'd love to know that story. That would be an interesting story for me. I ain't farmed too much grain in my time. But in that time, they had the grain harvest, and it was the busy time of year when you're harvesting grain. In most of our jobs, though, we have a busy time, right? I just want to give a shout out to anybody who is working with numbers and doing taxes right now, the tax prepare people. we got a couple of accounting folks 
who are in our church family. Um, shout out to Sandy and Jamie and whoever else does accounting right now. This is y'all's busy season. God bless you. I wouldn't want your job for nothing. Uh, I remember I had a job one time that the busy season was right at November, to December. When I was in my early 20s, I worked for a Christmas tree operation. Man, I was in so much better shape back then. I was ripped back then because I was lugging big Christmas trees all around. The Christmas trees were grown in Floyd, beautiful Floyd County, Virginia. And they were taken down the mountain to beautiful Roanoke, Virginia, where we sold them at the mall. And I would spend weekends uh, lugging giant Christmas trees onto on top of even more giant SUVs. And this was back when Hummers were like a big thing before people figured out that those things drink a lot of gas and nobody wants to put gas in them. So imagine I'm like lugging a Christmas tree on top of like a fifty, sixty thousand dollar Hummer. Dude, well, I would not, if I had a fifty, sixty thousand dollar car, first of all, I probably won't. But if I did, I sure wouldn't throw a Christmas tree on top of it. But it was good. I could make a lot, you know, make some money for Christmas down there. And my, my, uh, what are these deltoids? My deltoids were ripped back then from doing all them overhead presses up onto the Humvees of the Christmas trees. That was the busy time of year. So crazy busy. And when I was done with that, I was so happy it was done. This thing, the thing about busy times is when we're finally through the busy time, we like to relax a little bit. It feels like a time to celebrate. And uh, back in those days, I celebrated by buying Christmas presents for my wife because that's what I was doing. Didn't have kids at the time, and uh, so didn't have them to buy for. It's a celebration when we're finished with some big, busy season. And uh, the Lord created a holiday for the Old Testament believers that celebrated the end of that very busy season, the end of the, the grain harvest. Now, we're going to study this. It's called the Feast of Weeks. Feast of Weeks, W-E-E-K-S. It's uh, one of the seven holidays that the Lord created in the Old Testament for the believers then. And uh, as followers of Jesus in the New Testament era, we're not required to keep these holy days. However, we can learn a lot from them. If you missed any of those messages, go back and pick them up. I think the first one was the first Sunday of January. You can go back on our YouTube channel and our podcast. If you're a podcast person, we're streamed on just about every every audio streaming service that you can think of or find. You can find us and you can get our own messages. I think we're up to something like 80, 70 or 80 messages now that you can pick up on the podcast. That's pretty cool. goes out all over the world. We have people listening in like... Europe and South America and Asia. I don't know what that's about. I don't know how people in France find out about Hillsville. I don't know. I just say God's good and we praise God. So you are a part of something right now that goes far beyond this parking lot and the food line and Family Dollar and Pizza Hut parking lots. It goes all over the world. That is mind-blowing to me. Only God can make something like that happen. So Last week we talked about the Feast of the First Fruits. That was a holiday where God asked his people to bring the first part of the grain harvest, the very beginning of the grain harvest, and make an offering. And it was their way of saying, Lord, I'm going to trust you with the whole harvest. I'm going to trust you with the beginning, and, and I'm counting on you to bless the whole thing. The Feast of Weeks came at the end of the grain harvest, so it's kind of like one at the beginning, one at the end. It's called the Feast of Weeks because seven weeks plus one day passed between the Feast of First Fruits and this. Fifty days. Seven weeks plus one day. I know Feast of Weeks is not like the most marketable name. Like no marketing firm would say, yes, let's call this holiday the Feast of Weeks. I think that would work. Let's make, let's make our Instagram page the Feast of Weeks. No, that wouldn't happen today. But I don't think God was too worried about marketing back then. He just kind of called it what he wanted to call it. So it was the Feast of Weeks. It came after. They had the one at the beginning and the one at the end. It's kind of like saying grace over the meal before you eat it and after you eat it. But, it, you know, maybe we should say give thanks after we eat the meal because then you're in a greater position to understand how much thanks you should give. Or if you should say, you know, thank you, Lord, for this food we're about to receive uh, and bless to the nourishment of our bodies. I heard that so many times. Or you might say, thank you for this, Lord and please prevent it from doing things to my body that I'm afraid it's going to do. All right? There was one time that I ate a hamburger at a cookout that was still mooing, okay? And I was just praying. I prayed a lot over that meal. I prayed more over that meal than anything else because I had a two-and-a-half-hour drive, and I didn't know what was going to happen in that two-and-a-half hours. 
after that hamburger. But I made it. I made it. I did not get food poisoning. It was okay. And, uh, yeah, well, anyway, first fruits was about trusting God to bless the harvest. And the Feast of Weeks was about thanking God for the harvest with which he had blessed them. We can always use a reminder to be thankful. We need that. The Lord bless, pours a lot of blessings out on us, but the greatest benefit to us about the Feast of Weeks is not the reminder of thankfulness. It is the foreshadowing of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. This is one of those examples of where the Old Testament and the New Testament meet in a very beautiful way. We're going to be in the Old Testament to start with Leviticus 23. If you want to find that, if you got a you know, a physical Bible with you. Totally okay to have your device out and look that up as long as you're engaging in the service. Leviticus 23. If you look in your Bible and you have a study Bible and it has headings, it might be headed the Feast of Weeks or the Feast of Harvest. Or there's another name, the New Testament name, that might be listed there, but I'm not going to talk about that just yet. I want to save it for later. Here's what I want you to see, though. What we're about to read sounds like this obscure bit of Old Testament stuff about this odd holiday where God's asking them to do this and do that, but it points forward to the beginning of an incredible movement. So let's not get lost in all the little fine details here. Let's see what God was doing all as a whole. We're in Leviticus 23 verses 15 through 22, and I'm going to read it in its entirety and then pray for us. From the day after the Sabbath, the day you bring the bundle of grain to be lifted up as a special offering, that is, it's talking about first fruits here. He says, count off seven full weeks. Keep counting until the day after the seventh Sabbath, 50 days later. Then present an offering of new grain to the Lord. From wherever you live, bring two loaves of bread to be lifted up before the Lord as a special offering. Make these loaves from four quarts of choice flour. Bake them with yeast. There will be an offering to the Lord from the first of your crops. Along with the bread, present seven one-year-old male lambs with no defects, one young bull, two rams as burnt offerings to the Lord. These burnt offerings, together with the grain offerings and liquid offerings, will be a special gift, a pleasing aroma to the Lord. Then you must offer one male goat as a sin offering, and a two-year-old male and and two one-year-old male lambs as a peace offering. The priest will lift up the two lambs as a special offering to the Lord together with the loaves. That same day will be proclaimed an official day for a holy assembly, a day in which you do no ordinary work. It is a permanent law for you and must be observed from generation to generation wherever you live. And then a little bit of bonus added on to there, verse 22. When you harvest the crops of your land, do not harvest the grain along the edges of your field. Do not pick up whatever the harvesters drop. Leave it for the poor and the foreigners among you. I am the Lord, your God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, there's so much here for us to unpack, and I pray that you'll help us get the essential truths of it. Please, Lord, show us the movement that was foreshadowed in this text and remind us that we are called to be a part of that movement as it continues today. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we read this scripture, and there's a lot going on. On most of these Old Testament holidays, there was a lot of moving parts, and we see that there was a lot of uh, offering of agricultural stuff, you know, livestock and grain and flour and stuff like that. That sounds a little weird to us. That would not be normal for us to like build a bonfire in the parking lot and, and uh, you know, throw something on it as a sacrifice. That sounds a little weird now, like a pig picking sounds good. I would go for that. I would 100%. This is something different here. It just sounds strange to us, but if we understand it in the context of that time and culture, it makes perfect sense. They lived in a society where most people were connected to farming, and most people did not have a lot of cash money. What they had were livestock and crops. In those days, wealth was not primarily measured in cash. It was measured in cows. Cows were your wealth. Livestock were your wealth. So. For them to give sacrificially meant offering their agricultural produce and their livestock. That's what it meant for them. That's what they had to give. Now for us, living in a time that's not a bartering economy, by and large, when we give sacrificially, for us it's probably going to mean 
getting some of the income that we've worked hard to make. That's what giving looks like for us. That's what we have to give. Personally, I don't, I don't have seven male lambs one year old at the house. I got some chickens, but if I were to lay a finger on those chickens, my children would lay a finger on me brutally. I wish I had a, as good a life as the 12 chickens do. They're so loved and petted. And if those eggs, if the quality of an egg depends on the quality of care that a chicken gets, I don't know why they ain't laying golden eggs. They should be. The yolks are golden. Colored. Golden colored. So yeah, well, just want you to understand in cultural context that it sounds weird to us, but it wasn't weird then. It was 100% normal then. And of course, all those Old Testament blood sacrifices were to set up the understanding of how when Jesus came, he would be the ultimate sacrifice. So don't let the sacrificial stuff throw you off more than anything. It was to prepare the world to understand who Jesus is and believe in him. If you kept count here, that's quite a few animals being given. Like 12, it's like seven lambs and two rams, one male goat and two more lambs. And What are they doing with all that? Well, if you read it carefully, read other passages in tandem with it, you find out they didn't offer the whole animal. It was only certain parts. So the rest of that meat was going home with the family. And it was a lot of it too. You know, unless you had a huge family, you weren't going to be able to eat all that at the barbecue. And poorer people would not have had so many animals to offer. So what I picture, you guys may be able to correct me if I'm wrong, is that they would take all this back home to their community and have one big community party kind of like that big community birthday party I think we ought to have. You know, they would roast it up. We, I look forward to that. We'll get, bust out the grill, make some hamburgers. And if you don't do hamburger, if you're a vegan person, you bring some vegan hot dogs and we will do those up for you too. And I'll even eat one with you, though I will be tempted to put some non-vegan chili on it. But if that's what I got to do to show solidarity with you, as the apostle said, <laughs> apostle Paul said, you know, eat what is offered to you, even if it's a tofu dog. Just eat it. Eat it and be thankful. Don't ask questions. So that's that's 100% what I'll do. Did you notice that there's also loaves of bread? Loaves of bread were offered here. Big old loaves of bread. It talks about four quarts of flour being used. Four quarts is a gallon. That is 16 cups of flour. Now, I don't know if that is 16 cups in each of these two loaves of bread or if it's eight cups, half of that. That's still a big old loaf of bread. I was talking to, to Diane, who's one of our resident bakers, and she said an eight cup loaf of bread would be more than twice as big as a normal loaf of bread. A big old loaf of bread. Humongous. So even if it's only eight, eight cups in it, it's a big old loaf of bread. So they had these two loaves of bread and they would offer them, and as I understand it, those loaves of bread would go home with the priest who offers a sacrifice. So just, just as you... Just to be clear, making loaves of bread and bringing them to the preacher is a completely biblical thing to do. That is entirely biblical and acceptable. <laughs> acceptable unto the Lord. No, I'm just saying, man, I probably don't need the bread, but I'll take it. I'll 100% take it, even though I probably don't need to. So uh, they would offer these loaves. Uh, let's keep those loaves in mind. We're going to need those loaves, all right? I think you'll be able to remember two fresh hot loaves of yeast bread, right? That won't take a lot of work to kind of keep that steaming in the back of your mind. We're going to pick those loaves of bread up a little bit later. In addition to the other offerings, they were told not to harvest parts of their fields. Remember, the Feast of Weeks had to do with the harvest of grain, specifically the wheat harvest at this point. That's what they were finishing up. And he told them, don't don't do the edge of the field. I grew up on a farm, Dad. We would call that the back swath if we were mowing hay. The edges of the field did not get mowed, did not get harvested. And if they dropped anything, they were not to go back. And if they missed anything, they were not to go back and get it because all of that was to be left for the economically disadvantaged in the land, both um, the, the, the Jewish people that were there and didn't have much and the it says the foreigners living in the land. These are probably displaced people, refugees who had fled from somewhere. The Lord said to leave that for people to pick up who needed it. This would 
not only meet their immediate need for food, but hopefully it would kind of give them a leg up to where maybe they could get on their own feet. Hopefully they would gather enough where they would have some to plant next year. And next year they wouldn't have to go out picking up. They would have some that they could share with others. That was the plan anyway, to provide for the immediate needs, but also give them an opportunity to, to climb out of that situation and to get to self-sufficiency. But nobody went hungry in the meantime. Now, hey, I know it's hard to talk about this sort of thing without someone wanting to make it political. And I'll tell you right now, if you want to take this somewhere political, you're going to have to go by yourself because I'm not interested in making the trip. But what we do see here is a solution to the need that had compassion on people that met their immediate needs, but it also gave them the tools and the opportunity and the incentive to get out of that tough situation. So, man, that makes a lot of sense to me. You take it or leave it. So that's the Feast of Weeks. That's interesting, I suppose. And every part of the Bible is important. Every part of the Bible is interesting. But if it was not for the connection to the New Testament, this might have just been some kind of little interesting Bible trivia footnote. But this Feast of Weeks was pointing forward to something so amazing we cannot possibly overlook it. Now, you remember I told you the Feast of Weeks had another name. A New Testament name. A Greek name. How did a Hebrew holiday come to have a Greek name in addition to the Hebrew name? Well, I'll tell you how. Not everybody realizes this, but there's a gap of time between the end of the Old Testament and the end of the New Testament. The Old Testament ends with the book of Malachi. Malachi was written about 400 years before the book of Matthew opens up. So there's a gap of about 400 years. A lot of stuff happened in that time. During that period of time, around 300 years before Jesus was born, a guy named Alexander, some folks call him Alexander the Great, managed to conquer most of the Mediterranean region. Remember that guy from history class, Alexander the Great? And Greek became the language of trade throughout the whole Mediterranean region, pretty much from like what is now Spain to what is now uh, Iran, people could speak some Greek. Rome came along and took over for Greece, but the Greek language stayed. So, but there's plenty enough people who need Jesus that if 3,000 guys saved at a church service, I think would be okay. That would be so amazing. See, that was the day that a movement was born. That is considered the day that the church was born. The church as the body of believers in the truest sense when the Holy Spirit came down. You see, a church is never meant to be an institution, y'all. It's a movement. A church is never meant to be a building, though I'm thankful for our building. The church is a body. And we need to be so careful that Recreate Church never devolves into an organization when it's meant to be an organism, it's a living thing. We're part of a movement, a movement that started way back at the Feast of Weeks, Pentecost. That's where it got started. We're called to be something so much more. Now remember what the, the Feast of Weeks, also known as Pentecost, was meant to celebrate? The harvest, right? The end of the harvest, the completion of the harvest. But even more powerfully, it pointed forward to that day in Acts chapter 2, where the incredible harvest of souls began. Man, these people came from all over the place. If you read Acts chapter 2, it lists like 15 nationalities of people who were in Jerusalem at that time. Because Pentecost, the Feast of Weeks, was one of the pilgrim festivals. So all the believers, anybody who could possibly come, was supposed to make the trip to Jerusalem and participate in it there. So there were the city was full. There were people everywhere from all over over the place. People from the Middle East and North Africa and all over the Mediterranean region. And most of these folks, of course, had Jewish roots or had converted to Judaism. Well, after all, they were in town for a Jewish feast day, a Jewish festival. But once they heard the good news of Jesus, they took it back to their hometowns, back to their home regions. It was this, like, first century version of viral messaging, okay? There was there was no Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, none of that, but there were people who took the message back, and pretty soon people who never had any historical connection to Judaism began to believe in the Jewish Messiah, and 
this Jesus movement just keeps growing and growing and growing and it, it just keeps going now. Did you we see that the church was was very diverse from the beginning. It was people from all over the place. And that's good news for us because we live in a time that feels awfully divided, doesn't it? Awfully divided. Remember those two loaves of bread? You remember those? Those hot, steaming loaves of yeast, bread, giant loaves of bread, 8 to 16 cup loaves of bread? Well, a lot of Bible interpreters believe that those loaves of bread were a foreshadowing of what the Lord would do in Pentecost and afterwards. That these two loaves of bread that were presented to the priest represented the two great divisions of humanity that would be, re be given to Christ all at once. The two great divisions of humanity, according to the Jewish line of thought, were Jews and non-Jews, that is, Jews and Gentiles. A lot of people believe that the two loaves of bread represented the Jews and the Gentiles, and they were both given to the priest, and we see the Jews and the Gentiles are both being presented to Christ. This is the the biggest division of humanity and in Jesus it's been brought together as one we live in times where life where the world seems so divided culture is so divided in every single way it is an encouragement to me to know that if Jesus closed the gap between Jew and Gentile which is so much greater than any division that we know he can bring people together in our time too Jesus created the church to break through the barriers that divide us and make us one family. The church is the community of Jesus followers with a special calling to, trans to transcend ethnicity and nationality, education, economics, language, and yes, even politics. Jesus transcends all of that, everything that divides people. The culture in which we live talks a lot about inclusion, but is very quick to exclude people who don't go with the flow. The same culture that preaches tolerance cancels anybody who doesn't fall into a very specific set of values. The culture is not going to bring people together. The church has a calling to bring people together. The church has a calling to set the standard for loving and valuing people, even if they believe messed up stuff that we can't agree with. You see, we got to figure out we can love someone and treat them good and show them the love of Jesus and lead them towards Jesus even if they got the, the wrong ideas about a lot of stuff. You see, we, we love each other. We say we're the church that no matter your story, you're welcome, you're wanted, and you're loved. doesn't mean we can agree or approve of any particular choice you make. Man, I make choices that I can't approve of. You know, I still mess up myself. If you're looking for a stamp of approval, I cannot give you that. But if you're looking for love, we can give you that. If you're looking for people who love you anyway, even if we disagree with you, that's what we're trying to do here. That's what we got to call in to do. And we got to believe that through that love, eventually you'll see that that love does not come from us. It comes from Jesus who lives in us. And that he is worth loving and following and giving your life to. The Festival of Weeks, also known as Pentecost, is a powerful story. It points forward. The, the Feast of Weeks was the celebration of the completion of the harvest. But in Pentecost, we see the harvest is only beginning. In the Feast of Weeks, it was a blessing for bringing the sheaves into the barn. And in Pentecost, it was a blessing for bringing souls into the family of God. A new movement was being born. So hear this, you folks. Hear this. We're not waiting around on God to move. He's inviting us to move with Him. He's moving. God ain't sitting still. Do you think God has taken the pandemic off? Do you think God's like, you know, well, they got a little while in this pandemic. I think I'm just going to take it easy for a while. I don't think so. God doesn't take breaks. A movement of God is happening. And the question is whether or not we'll seek it and follow it and be a part of it. Hey, in some small way, a movement of God began yesterday. We had our first attempt at a virtual group yesterday. And it was a little buggy, but we tried it, and and some of us were there for part of it and kind of lost it, and some of us were there for the whole time, but we're going to make that work because we have a responsibility to still be a part of this. Hey, if you want to be a part of our virtual groups when we sort of get them 
worked out and get the kinks worked out, let me know. Our contact information is on our website, recreatechurch.org, and we'll hook you up with a virtual group and make that happen somehow or another. You see, even in times like now, when it seems like we're, we're waiting something out, God's still moving around us. And it's not really time to just take a break. Okay, remember the story. Remember this, how it led up to Pentecost. Jesus rose from the dead on the day of first fruits. Forty days he walked upon the earth. But what day? And then he rose up to heaven. But how many days were there between him rising up to heaven and then the Holy Spirit coming down? How many days? Ten days, right? Ten days. In the scriptures, ten days tends to be a symbol of a period of testing, a period of waiting. So it was those ten days of waiting What were they doing during those ten days of waiting? They were watching, and they were praying, and they were seeking the Lord. They weren't just sort of chilling, watching Netflix, you know, I wonder what good series can we watch on Hulu tonight? No, they they were invested in following and seeking the Lord and waiting and watching for what was going to come down. It was an active kind of waiting, you know, and when when the time came for the blessing to come down, they were ready, and God started a whole movement out of that. I don't know what's coming out of this pandemic, y'all. I don't know how much longer it's going to last. And, and, you know, lots of questions and lots of different opinions. But all I know is this. The same God from then is the same God we serve now. The same one who started a movement all those years ago is still moving now. And we're invited to be a part of that movement. It might look a little different today. We might have to go about it a little different today. I might have to preach on a street corner in the middle of a town in Appalachia to make it happen. But by the grace of God, we'll do it. We're called to be a part of this movement. And my prayer is that we, us, everyone who's a part of this, live here or listening or watching later on, that we'll seek the Lord through this season, through this period of testing. Because we don't get to get a doctor's note that says we don't have to be in gym class right now. We don't get a note that says, well, we can't be the church right now because of COVID. No. We're still the body of Christ no matter if there's a pandemic. Yeah, we take precautions. Yeah, we do what we have to do, but we are called to be the movement. So instead of waiting on the end of the pandemic to celebrate, though I think we need to have that cookout, we need to be celebrating right now about what God is doing right now. I'm excited about what God's doing. These outdoor services have mean, meant people have discovered us that would not normally know that we're even here. This is awesome. Now, I understand wintertime is cold. Trust me, I know it was below freezing last week, and I was freezing. And I'm so glad for 50 degrees or whatever it is now. It feels like heaven. It's wonderful. we got to make it work, though. God is moving. And I thank God for the movement He's made in me during this pandemic. Has the Lord moved in you during the pandemic? He's moved in me. I'm not the same person that I was a year ago. The Lord has made me face some ugly stuff inside of me and deal with it and work it out. And I hope He'll do the same thing for you too. Let's go to the Lord right right now in prayer and let's pray that He moves in us. Father in heaven, thank You that even when the world seems to stand still, You are still moving. And I pray You'll move in us. Work in our hearts. The disciples waited in the upper room for 10 days. A period of testing. I don't know how long we'll have to wait, Lord, until positive change comes, but we're going to wait and watch and obey and ask you to move in us. Lord, make us your movement in our families, in our workplaces, in the places we go to school, in the places we do business in our own homes, in our community. Make us your move. Lord, I want to pray for anyone listening to this who's never trusted in Jesus, that they might see all the scriptures come together, all of history converges onto him. And the wisest, most sensible thing to do is trust in him as Savior. God, I pray for them now that they would call upon your name and be saved. And I pray for all of us. We're struggling down here, Lord. Seems like things aren't going to change. We're getting tired of it. But I pray that you'll help us to see that even in the midst of all this, you're moving. And I pray you move in us. Lord, we give you the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. So glad to have had you here as a part of this. We do it every Sunday at 10 a.m. 
and 5 p.m. If you want to catch old messages, go on to any kind of audio streaming services and look up Recreate Church. Go on to YouTube and look up Recreate Church. Let other people know about it. Thank you all for your encouragement to me and part of what we do. If you want to know how you can get more involved, contact us and we'll hook you up. God bless you all. I'll send you home with a little music. We'll see you next time. Thank <laughs> you.